Saga of a New World, Book One, Dawn of the New World. Chapter Eight, High Rock. As they leave the compound, they can already see the town in the distance. The fog still hangs around it, clinging to the buildings, even as a cold wind tosses leaves into the air and blows Astrid's hair around. The fog continues to move in that slow, random, supernatural manner, apparently undisturbed by the moving air. While making a beeline across the open fields would be the fastest way to High Rock, it would also leave them exposed to getting attacked by one of those massive birds that roam the sky, which someone had dubbed Grippers, a fitting name considering they swoop down from the sky and grab their prey. Instead, the group decides to take the road that runs along the edge of the forest. Should a Gripper or something similar appear, they could run into the shadow of the trees for cover, and if something attacks them from the forest, they can run out into the open. Their horses trot along, while behind them the tractor roars with almost as much noise as a jackhammer. Finn points down the road. Let's ride ahead and make sure the road is clear. He doesn't wait for an answer, and spurs Shiva into a gallop, immediately followed by the sheriff and Poldy. Astrid barely needs to tap her legs against Ranger's body to make him follow suit. They gallop over the road until the sound of cracking twigs surprises them from the forest. It's so loud, they can hear it over the clopping of hooves against the pavement. The three riders simultaneously rein in their horses and stop. What is that? Astrid asks. She squints and sees a large shape move between the trees but the young trees and bushes growing next to the road prevent her from actually seeing the creature. Astrid expects the others to go for their weapons, but Finn only turns his horse and gets ready to bolt if the creature turns out to be hostile, while the sheriff waits and watches the thick tree line. More twigs snap beneath heavy feet. Astrid can see a light red glow from between the leaves before a massive head slowly emerges. It's covered in bone armor, and has a small, pointed mouth made from bone that looks a bit like a beak. Protruding from the back of its head are four triangular horns. The creature doesn't seem even the slightest bit interested in them as it stomps out of the forest. Four relatively short legs carry a long, slightly oval body covered in knobbed bone armor. The body ends with a long tail that itself ends in a bone club covered in more small knobs. It places an armored foot on the road, cracking the asphalt. With booming steps, it crosses the road and begins grazing on the meadow, while part of its body remains on the pavement. Including the tail, the whole creature is about as long as two cars and as tall as two humans. They all stare at the massive creature as it devours a bush whole. Finn whispers, God, that thing has to weigh almost ten tons. It looks almost like an ankylosaur. With his mouth open, he watches it close its beak over a whole patch of grass. How is that possible? The sheriff doesn't bother to whisper, A what? A dinosaur. It looks almost like a dinosaur. I can't believe it. The sheriff just shrugs. It seems harmless. Okay, maybe not harmless, but not out to kill us. Let's go tell the others something's blocking the road. While she turns her horse and starts to ride back, Astrid looks at Finn and says, Are you serious? I've been transformed into an elf, and your father is a mix between a dwarf and a teddy bear, but it's something that looks like a dinosaur that takes your breath away? Those are the things that made me wake up this morning convinced that yesterday was a dream. This is something that takes my breath away because I've been a fan of dinosaurs since I was small. Seeing one in person, or at least something that kinda looks like one is... Well, let's just say it makes up for the fact that my laptop is deep fried. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually looking forward to finding out what other creatures this event created. As Finn talks, they both turn their horses to trot after the sheriff. With a smile, Astrid replies, 
And now this all turns out to be a very intricate dream, and your mother is about to throw you out of bed. Finn smiles back. If this is a dream, I have to say I'm impressed with my brain's imagination and attention to detail. The moment I wake up, I'm writing all this down. It doesn't take them long to get back to the rest of the group. As he sees them come back, Finn's father stops and turns off the engine. What's going on? Is something wrong? An ankylosaur is blocking the road, Finn informs him, before the sheriff can say a word. A what? They ride up to the tractor and turn their horses. The sheriff explains. It's a big living tank of bone. Not hostile, but big and probably very dangerous if we anger it. Mr. Rot nods and says, So that's where that thing went. <sighs> okay, we'll drive over the field. The three riders once again gallop ahead, while the tractor rolls onto the grass. The ankylosaur is still in the same spot, munching grass, just like they left it. As the tractor makes a wide arc around it, the animal looks up. Its small, black eyes follow the loud machine. Astrid, Finn, and the sheriff watch the tractor slowly drive around it from the road. Everyone suddenly tenses up as the creature moves its front leg. It turns to keep both eyes on the tractor, then, without warning, slams its tail on the floor. Upon impact, it cracks the pavement with a loud boom. The message is clear as crystal. Come closer, and I'll crush you like bugs. Everyone tenses up. They expect the creature to rush the tractor, but it doesn't. It just continues to stare at them until they get back on the road. The moment the tractor heads away from it, the ankylosaur puts its head back down and continues eating. As they continue down their journey, Astra turns her head to look at the grazing ankylosaur. Did you see what that tail did to the road? I don't even want to know what it would do to a person. Thank God that thing isn't aggressive, Finn agrees. As Finn's father passes them, he yells, That thing was actually once one of our cows, I think. It busted down our barn and killed several other animals. As they continue, the town comes into view once more. The buildings are shrouded in the dark grey fog. It is nowhere near as thick as what appeared during the event, but it still obstructs their vision. The fog seems to roll and waft in every direction apparently unaffected by both wind and gravity. Moving closer to the city limits, the dark mist stretches outwards like it's trying to spread into the surrounding area, but dissipates as soon as it clears the relatively tightly packed buildings. No animal, not even a single bug flies through the air here. The bushes and trees in the fog have lost their leaves and turned black. Behind the group are beautiful meadows covered in hundreds of different plants, old and new. In front of them, there is only dark, desecrated earth covered in the black remains of dead life. The sounds of birds and insects give way to silence. The only sounds are that of the horse's hooves clapping against the pavement and those made by the tractor behind them. Let's check the street, make sure nothing's there. Finn whispers as though the fog itself is listening. For all they know, it might be. As they get closer to the buildings, wafts of fog begin to move along the ground. They creep between the horse's legs, almost as though they are attracted to the living flesh. The animals seem uneasy. Ranger slows his steps and moves his head around. His eyes are wide. He looks behind him and to his sides, checking on the other horses. Astrid can feel his breathing get faster as the fog envelops them. A chill runs down her spine. She shivers. The mist looks thicker from within. It might be her imagination, but the air around them feels cold, and her skin tingles like there are a million tiny ants crawling over it. The silence around them is unnatural. The only noise is the tractor in the distance, and the wind quietly blowing between the buildings. But even those sounds seem dulled and distant. Something tells Astrid that the houses around them are graves, that no one who spent a night in this darkness is still alive. 
Some sort of instinct seems to trigger within her a deep, primal sense of fear, almost as though something inside her knows that nothing but death awaits them here. Meanwhile, the fog seems to thicken around them. While they could easily see down the entire road when they were outside the cloud, it already obscures the end of the road with swirling darkness. I... Astrid stammers. Fear grips her, almost paralyzing her. Her eyes flick to the sheriff to see that she's turned as white as snow. The other elf's gaze is fixed on a point somewhere in the fog. Her hands shake, as do Astrid's. Neither resists as their horses rip the reins out of their hands and turn around. Finn sees his two companions turn. He has to look twice to believe what he's seeing. What? What are you two doing? His own horse, seeing its friends turn, tries to follow, but Finn has other plans. He holds the reins tight to keep her from turning. Shiva ignores his commands and stumbles after Ranger. Something is wrong here, Astrid whispers. I can feel it. This place is not for the living. What the hell? We're supposed to get medicine so that my mother... So that people don't start dying... Finn is cut off by Shiva, who suddenly rears up. To stop himself from flying off her back, he's forced to grab her mane and release her reins. She immediately gallops forward as fast as she can. Ranger, seeing his friend Bolt, follows at full speed. It's not until they leave the cloud that the horses slow down. Astrid swears she can feel her horses pounding hard over her own. As the three come galloping out of the fog, the rest on the tractor is about to enter. What's going on? Finn's father yells over the roaring engine. Finn struggles against Shiva. These dumb horses refuse to stay in the fog, he yells, while trying to turn Shiva back towards the cloud. The horse twists her neck with the reins but refuses to turn. We should head back, Astrid says. This place is cursed, I can feel it. Finn's father twitches his eyebrow again, but it is the sheriff that speaks. The horses refuse to go in there, but if we don't get that medicine, people at the farm are going to die. We promised we would get it, so we will. I'll come on the tractor. She still looks deathly pale and her eyes wide as she dismounts Poldy and jumps onto the tractor. Mr. Rod takes a look at the fog, then at Astrid. He scans her face and sees the fear in her eyes. We're not leaving the horses on their own. You too. He points at his son and then at Astrid. Check out that house over there while we take the tractor into the fog. As he speaks, he points at a house removed from the rest of the town. It's far enough away to not be touched by the black mist. We can just... Finn starts, but his father cuts him off. We're not leaving the horses. Do as I say. Without waiting for more protest from his son, he makes Lucas accelerate the tractor. Finn looks like he wants to say something, but stays quiet and watches the vehicle lurch forward. Astrid doesn't need another excuse not to go back into the cloud and squeezes her thighs against Ranger's flanks to make him walk towards the house. Finn makes an angry grunt as he ties the reins of the sheriff's horse to his own and makes both follow Ranger. Astrid looks back in time to see the tractor drive into the cloud. She somehow expects the fog to envelop them like she's sure it did to her. Nothing changes, though. The large red machine calmly drives down the narrow road. Angry, Finn turns to Astrid. What the hell was that? If you hadn't let Ranger turn around, Shiva wouldn't have panicked. Astrid feels fury flare up as she replies. I was almost paralyzed by fear, and I still think it's a horrible idea to go into that stuff. To herself, she thinks, Great, where was that temper ten minutes ago when I almost lost it because of a little fog? Great, and here I thought your size indicated bravery. What were you before you turned into an elf? A three-year-old? Astrid glares at him. I think the horses have excellent judgment. If you'd watched any horror movie ever, you'd know that walking into a dark, magical fog that causes animals to go batshit crazy with fear is a bad idea. 
I also think it's a bad idea to let several people die because I'm scared of a bit of magical mist. Besides, you volunteered for this, didn't you? Astrid doesn't reply. She just loosens her reins and takes Ranger into a trot. Finn snorts and shakes his head. Astrid reaches the house first. Why is the door open? She wonders out loud. What, scared of an open door as well? Finn sneers at her. With a glare, Astrid pushes past Finn and, aiming down the sights of her revolver, she enters the building. The first thing that hits her as she steps across the threshold is the faint but distinct smell of rot. A pungent odor with just a hint of sickening sweetness. Slowly, carefully, Astrid walks into the dimly lit space beyond the entrance. She jumps around a corner and aims her gun down an empty hallway. To her right is a door that stands slightly ajar and allows sunlight to leak into the dark room they're in right now. The wooden floorboards give off a quiet creak as Astrid walks towards the door and waves for Finn to follow her, who enters the house, rifle in hand. His heavy boots create a quiet thud every time they connect with the floor. Astrid glances back and gets a short, closer look at the weapon for the first time. She sees that it not only has two barrels, but two triggers as well. Finn's finger rests on the back one as he aims down the hallway. With one hand on the doorknob and one aiming her revolver, Astrid pushes the living room door open. They are met by a wall of light shining through large windows onto stylish modern furniture and the corpse of a man. His head is split open and his skin has turned completely white, save for several green and blue spots, the first signs of decomposition. Behind her, Finn gags. Well, that takes care of my appetite, he tries to joke, but the fact that he whispers and has turned a bit pale betrays that he's more than just disgusted. Astrid shudders and tears her eyes away from the gruesome sight. Let's check the kitchen, no point in letting his food rot, too. Seriously, how can you think about food right now? Finn asks her, his gaze still fixed on the corpse. I'm starving. While I search the kitchen, why don't you try to help this guy? I'm sure a bit of CPR is going to get him right back on his feet. He pulls his gaze away from the dead man to glare at Astrid. You don't have to be so sarcastic. Someone died here. I think a bit of respect is in order. Astrid shakes her head, turns away, and walks out of the living room. Luckily, the door to the kitchen is closed, meaning that the putrid smell of death hasn't penetrated the room too much, at least not enough to discourage Astrid's stomach. It hasn't left her alone all day, and now that she's surrounded by a kitchen filled with food, it demands to be filled. She pulls open the cupboards to search for a plate. Somehow, she feels a bit weird, rummaging through someone else's kitchen. It doesn't bother her enough to make her stop, though. To her delight, the fridge is filled to the brim. While Astrid stuffs herself in the kitchen, Finn searches the rest of the house. The corpse in the living room might very well be the man who infected his mother, and with any luck, he might find something, anything, that can help the doctor save her. With his gun at the ready, he heads upstairs. The first thing he hears is someone whimpering. He considers calling Astrid, but yelling might scare the person in the other room, or warn them. A few more quiet steps put him right in front of the door the whimpering is coming from. The finger on the back trigger is ready to unleash a shotgun blast from his weapon's upper barrel. With a push, he opens the door to reveal a small bedroom. The blinds are almost closed, but the few rays of sunlight that make it through keep the dark at bay. The air is thick with a slightly moldy, sweet smell, a neither revolting, nor agreeable scent that fills a sick person's room. Finn slows his breathing and only takes shallow breaths as he scans the room over the barrel of his weapon. He hears a rustle to his left. A quiver rushes through his body and he snaps the weapon onto the source of the sound. 
It came from a bed on the left side of the room. Sheets moved to reveal the face of a girl, no older than sixteen. Her eyes widen as she stares straight down the weapon's two barrels. A scream tries to form, but her voice is too weak. It's barely a whisper, but still shrill as she asks, Who are you? What are you doing here? Finn instantly lowers his gun, but doesn't remove his finger from the trigger. I'm Finn. Don't worry, we're here to help. What happened? The girl does her best to sit upright, revealing the bite mark on her shoulder. Her voice is barely a whisper as she says, My father, he attacked me and bit me in the shoulder. I felt myself get weaker and weaker until I fell unconscious. Then I woke up here feeling like shit. Where is that ass anyway? He's dead. The girl doesn't reply. She just sits there, staring at Finn, her expression blank. Downstairs, Astrid continues plundering the fridge, unlike a few days ago, where she would have resisted the urge to pour pudding down her throat, today she indulges. Before the fog, her biggest concern in that regard had been to keep the calories away and the fat off her thighs. Back then, her conscience would have stepped in when she thought about eating too much chocolate, now it does the exact opposite. Her primary goal is no longer just getting full, but gathering as many of those calories as possible. She's all the more annoyed when Finn calls out her name. What is it? She yells back. I found someone, but she's too weak to walk. Help me. Astrid rolls her eyes and groans. She drops the salami she was just eating and goes to help Finn. At the door... Astrid pauses for a moment. She considers closing the refrigerator and cupboard, but dismisses it with half a thought. After all, there is no power and no one to care. As soon as Astrid sees the girl, she spots the infected bite mark on her shoulder. She's infected. Yes, help me get her outside. Astrid hesitates a moment before she slowly comes closer. She feels uneasy as she slings the girl's arm over her shoulder, but does it anyway. Let's hope the doctor is right, she thinks as they carry the weak girl outside. Finn props her up on Poldy, then mounts his own horse and rides towards the road. Shouldn't we wait inside? Astrid asks Finn as they are already halfway towards the road. The others ought to be done by now, he yells over his shoulder. Astrid quickly mounts Ranger and rides after the two. A quiet bang splits the silence from within the fog, causing them to stop. The gunshot is followed by deathly silence. What was that? The girl croaks from Poldy's back. Finn squints into the fog. Very bad news, he whispers. Another gunshot splits the air, quickly followed by a third. They spur their horses and race to the road leading into the town, but stop right outside the grey mass. Astrid jumps off Ranger as another gunshot sounds from within the dark mist, this time closer. Then, the town turns silent once more. They listen for more shots, or the roaring of the tractor, but only the quiet drone of the wind blowing between the buildings and the heavy breathing of the girl behind them greets their ears. The quiet is even worse than the gunshots. While it meant the rest of the expedition was in trouble, at least shooting meant that they were still alive. Astrid takes a few more steps forward. For a moment, she considers running after them, running into the fog to find them. Even if she barely knows them, the thought that they might all be dead fills her with dread. Her feet take another step forward. She wants to burst into a sprint, run to the others and help them with whatever has ambushed them in the toxic fog. However, the thought of entering the deadly mist triggers the same instinct as before. Her insides feel like they're being tied together as it fills her with fear. Fear of the deadly darkness and whatever might be waiting within it. Her feet freeze in place. Running in after them is futile. My instincts were right. That place ahead is for the dead. 
the dead and those who wish to join them. She doesn't notice Finn next to her until he screams, Dad, are you there? Anyone? His voice echoes through the street, but no one replies. There is only silence. Astrid knows what he wants to do. He's thinking the same thing she did. She doesn't know whether the instinctual knowledge that the black fog must be feared is something unique to otherworldly creatures such as herself, or if Finn is simply ignoring the dread filling his body. Perhaps he's stronger in that way. As he tries to sprint into the fog, she hugs him from behind. A few days ago, a man like him would have easily torn himself from her grasp, but now her embrace is like a vice. Let me go! I'm going after them. Stay here if you're scared. She does not release him. I'm not going back alone, she whispers in his ear, but he doesn't stop struggling. Astrid grunts as he rams his elbow into her gut, but doesn't even loosen her grip. Suddenly, another gunshot splits the silence, this time even closer. Hearing the sound, her grip relaxes and Finn stumbles forward. He quickly regains his balance, takes one more angry look at her, then sprints into the fog. She watches him as he turns a corner and disappears into the darkness. What's happening in there? The sick girl asks again. Astrid turns to face her. Our group went into the fog and now something... There must be something in the fog that's attacking them. Astrid turns back towards the town. The dark street is still abandoned. She doesn't believe that anyone is going to come back. Still, she stands here, staring into the swirling clouds, alone save for the girl she doesn't know. Suddenly, the roar of the tractor pierces the fog like a bullet of hope. A moment later, the machine drives around the corner at full speed, Lucas sitting alone in the driver's seat and the others holding on for dear life. Astrid immediately pulls her revolver out of its holster and aims into the fog, ready to shoot whatever creature might be chasing them. Following them are a few human figures. Astrid immediately lowers her gun, thinking that they must have found more of the townspeople alive. But they are not the silhouettes of people running through the mist. Lucas yells, Get on the horse, quick! The tractor roars past her as she struggles to climb onto Ranger as quickly as she can. Once she's in the saddle, her head turns for a quick look into the cloud behind her. The figures she could barely make out before have come closer, and their sight sends a shiver down her spine. They are transparent, as though their bodies are made from the fog that surrounds them. The figures silently glide over the ground, their ghostly limbs outstretched, reaching for the people running away from them. Behind the dark phantoms is another, taller figure, but a single look tells Astrid all she needs to know. She spurs her horse and yells, Ranger, go! Shiva, Paldi, come! Ranger happily obliges and takes off like a rocket. Seeing their fellow horse run off, Shiva and Poldi immediately follow so quickly that the girl on Poldi's back barely manages to hold on. They gallop after the speeding tractor. Unlike before, Lucas is driving the old machine at full speed and even in full gallop, the horses have trouble catching up to it. Astrid can't help herself and takes another look back. The figures are gone, leaving the fog as the same dark void that it was before. Still, she doesn't stop Ranger. They ride until the town is out of sight before they dare slow down. Even though Astrid didn't run herself, she is still out of breath. Her eyes move over the tractor to make sure that everyone is still there. The sheriff looks as white as a corpse. Noah is leaning against the side of the trailer. There's now a vaguely hand-shaped patch of grey fur on the side of his head. Finn is there too, but his father is not. Astrid trots Ranger next to the vehicle. Over the roaring engine she yells, What happened? Where's Mr. Rot? Noah's quiet reply is barely audible over the loud machine. 
We should never have gone in there. It's not just fog. There are ghosts in there. They got Mr. Rod. Our shots passed right through them, but their touch burned like fire. While Lucas struggles to drive the old machine on his own, Finn looks ahead with an empty stare and a chest filled with a whirlpool of anger and sadness. He went in there to save Mom, and now he's gone. The whirlpool turns into numbness, like in a drunken stupor. The thought that his father's spirit might even join these ghosts is even worse than the grief from his death. Finn almost wants to be angry at Astrid, but he knows that she's the only reason his mother will at least still have him. After a few moments of staring forward, he tries to shake the numbness out of his head by physically shaking it. It partially works, and he can muster the energy to stand back up. Too bad they didn't at the very least get the medicine, then his death wouldn't have been for nothing. Finn braces himself for the days to come. Anyone who needs some sort of medicine to live is going to die in the next few weeks. Thank you for listening to this Ember and Sparks production. Click the box on the left to listen to the next chapter or the box on the right to see an overview of all chapters available for this story. Check out the links in the description to listen to this audiobook without interruption. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to never miss a new story.